Sounds so interesting. Be nice to be able to just go around from table to table and listen. One of the first lessons, or one of the first Bible studies that we met, I read to you words that the choir had sung the morning before, or two days before, Be Still and Know. A few weeks ago, the children sang. Now, they sang again yesterday, or Sunday, but they didn't sing this song. And I asked Elaine if I could have the words, because they were such a blessing to hear the children singing. Be still, be still, be still and know that I am God. I will always love and care for you. Be still, be still and know. Sometimes you feel alone, like you haven't got a friend. It seems there's no one on whom you can depend. Don't be worried or frightened. I'll be with you every day. If you listen with your heart, you'll hear me say, Be still, be still, be still and know that I am God. I will always love and care for you. Be still, be still and know. Be still, be still, be still and know that I am God. I will always love and care for you. Be still, be still and know that I am creator of the universe, ruler over land and sky and sea. Yet I know you by name and I love you. My child, you are special to me. Be still, be still, be still and know that I am God. I will always love and care for you. Be still, be still and know. And to see those little young faces up there singing those words, words that we all need to live by, because when we're worrying, we're not being still. <laughs> but if we're still and know that God is in control, then it isn't a problem. If you can't hear me at any point in time, since I have a little bit of <laughs> competition, will you please just do this? I can be louder, but I don't want to be yelling at you. All right. I found some quotable quotes about what people think that I thought I'd start off with. Some of them are very humorous. You'll never be happy if you constantly worry about what people think about you. If you care about what others think of you, then you'll always be their slave. Your life isn't yours if you always care what others think. A lot of these things say the same thing but in a different way. Eleanor Roosevelt had a wonderful quote. You wouldn't worry so much about what others think if you realized how seldom they do, what they think, <laughs> think about you. Aren't we so busy wondering what they're thinking about us and they're not thinking about us at all? All right, I just love, that was my favorite. <coughs> Caring about what people think of you is useless. Most people don't even know what they think of themselves. <laughs> don't care what others think of you and you will save yourself a lot of mental energy that instead can be used to push you toward success. Worrying about the opinions of others can lower your basic competence in ordinary tasks such as making decisions. And then there are some mental tricks to stop worrying about what other people think. One, remember that people aren't that interested in you. Two, Tell yourself a different story. Three, meet other people. Four, try to make others comfortable. Five, focus on controlling your thoughts, not theirs. And don't try to please everyone. Elizabeth George wrote a wonderful chapter on what others think of you. I wrote the book and I wrote several volumes because that's been my problem my whole life, worrying about people, will, what they will think. Guy Ellen and I had the wonderful privilege and blessing of growing up on the campus of Bob Jones University. In those days, there were about a dozen of us, I was trying to count and remember and go around the faculty court and there may have been a few more or a few less, but of administrators' children and we were warned 
that we had to set the example that the students were looking at us and watching us and so I'm not saying that's a bad thing but I'm just saying I think that got us in the mode of being concerned about what people would think. Writing to Lawrence, and I'm telling on myself now, but I'm letting you know how much I needed this chapter. I don't know if you need it. I needed it. We were on our way down to Lawrence to a soccer game to watch two of our boys play, and I kind of taught the lesson to Lou all the way down. He's very patient, and he'll just drive and listen. And I was just saying, I just don't know if some of these illustrations go. I just don't know if this will fit together. I'm having a hard time. Finally, he just looked at me and says, don't worry about it. <laughs> and I started laughing, and I, then I double laughed. I said, well, I'm not only worrying about it, I'm worrying what the ladies are going to think about it. <laughs> so it, double problems for me. So... <laughs> Oh, and I have a disclaimer at the very beginning. I don't think we as Christian ladies should ever take the op opinion, I don't care what they think. I'm going to do what I want to do. I, I think that's the wrong approach. So I don't think we ever ought to get to that point. But what we shouldn't do is dwell on what are they thinking about me. And we all want to look nice. But if you're so concerned when you go to a party that you're not dressed as well as somebody else or what will they think or or did my hair not look good, or it didn't turn out, and that sort of thing. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the wrong approach. Elizabeth George in our chapter says, pleasing others will never have a good outcome. But when you put God first and desire to please Him and Him alone, that's a different story. And we're going to try to talk some today about that different story. We're also going to talk about what happens when we don't put Him first. Caring what people think shows a bit of pride on our part. Galatians 1.10 says, For I, do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of God. Point A and B sort of go together. They're like some of those quotes. They say about the same thing, but in a different way. Caring what people think means we are thinking too much about ourselves. Romans 12, 3 says, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Caring what people think means we're focusing on what people are thinking about us. Some years ago, there was a commercial. I have no idea what they were trying to uh, sell. But Abraham Lincoln is sitting over in his parlor. And Mary Todd comes in with this huge dress. You know how they used to wear dozens of petticoats and hoops and everything. And she comes in and she turns around and she says, Abraham, does this dress make me look fat? And she turned around. <laughs> And Abraham is just sitting there in the corner, his eyes kind of big, and he never says a word. <laughs> so if I'm concerned about something like that, I'll always just say to Lou, Abraham, and he knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> 1 Samuel 26, 7b. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance but the Lord looketh on the heart. He knows what's in our heart. Men will think what they will, so worrying about what they think won't help. I'm using some personal examples today because I'm just sharing <laughs> my failures, I guess, with you. But when Christy, our youngest daughter, got married to Kathy and Ted Perry's middle son, uh, we went out and bought her wedding dress, and it's so much fun when you go with them to find their wedding dress, and they find the perfect dress. You know, they put it on, it's like, oh, this is it. This is it. Well, I loved the dress, and I thought it was beautiful. It came up to her collarbones. I was looking at the picture again to make sure I got this right. It was a little bit sheer, not terribly sheer, but you could see through it at the top before the regular thicker material started where it should have started, and then went down the back. But when we got it home, I looked at it and I thought, oh, 
I don't know. I don't know what the people over at Morningside are going to think. If she wears that, it's sheer at the top, but it's sheer down the back, and I, I can see her back. So I paid quite a bit to have a wonderful seamstress, Mary Richards, <laughs> sew medallions. She got some that were the perfect match to what were already on Christy's dress. And she sewed them in the back, and she showed, sewed a few on the shoulders and up back. I still was kind of worried. And so Bob, our son, came by the house one day, and I just said, Bob, I'm worried about Christy's dress. It looks beautiful on her, and I'm just so afraid someone's going to be offended by the fact that it's sheer at the top. And he said, Mom, do you think the dress is modest? I said, well, of course I do. I wouldn't have let her buy it if I didn't think it was modest, even before they put the medallions on. He said, well, let me just tell you this. There are some people that are going to sit there and think, oh, that dress is not modest. There are going to be some people that are going to sit there and say, oh, that dress is just beautiful. You need to be concerned what you think, and if you think it's modest, and you think it's pleasing to the Lord, then don't give it another thought. I told him that he was here visiting with his wife and two of their children a few weeks ago, and I said, I'm going to talk about you, Bob. And he said, well, I didn't know I had that much wisdom back then. <laughs> so I said, well, you did. You just, you know, I was pleased with the dress. Now, the first time I can remember being very concerned about what people would think was when I was in the sixth grade in a public school. Bob Jones did not have uh, an elementary school then. I had wonderful teachers, but in the sixth grade, they decided they were going to bring in a professional and teach dance lessons every Friday for an hour, and everybody had to participate. Well, of course, I wasn't going to participate. Mother and Daddy would see to that if I decided I would. So then my teacher said, well, then you just come and you sit there on the front row and you watch them. Well, that defeated the purpose because I can watch somebody do something and learn how to do it. So then they decided I was going to go to the principal's office every week and sit outside her office and do work. Now, I was in the sixth grade, so that makes you, I think, about 11 or 12. And I can remember sitting there as people passed by, and all I could think of was, they think I've been bad and kicked out of class, and I have to sit out of Miss Ragsdale's office. A lady who was not a teacher in that school, but was a teacher and was visiting in that school and knew me well, said to me about eight years ago, I always felt so sorry for you sitting outside the principal's office because I knew that you thought people would think you had been bad, and I did. But anyway, that was a good lesson to learn. You have to stand up for your beliefs. And I will say not one student in my classroom ever made one derogatory remark about my not being in that class, dance class. They never said a word about my sitting outside of Miss Ragsdale's office either. Caring what people are thinking means we are trusting in our own ability to change what they think. We cannot change what people think. They will think what they will. We've heard the saying, you can please some of the people all the time. You can please all of the people some of the time, but you can't please all the people all the time. So we should worry about pleasing God and leave all the rest to the other people. Proverbs 23, 7a says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Secondly, caring what people think can keep us from being contented and from having peace. You may not think about it that way, but you can be very pleased with the way you look, and then you go somewhere and you look around and you think, oh, I don't think I dressed properly for this, and then we get to thinking about that. Elizabeth George had said this, and I used this in another lesson, contentment is, not, is a choice. It is not a happenstance. Philippians 4.11 says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Hebrews 13.5a, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. You can always look neat. 
you can always look nice. It doesn't have to be designer clothes. It doesn't have to be the latest fashion. You just have to dress the best you can. Focusing on what people think can make us change, dress, and act a different way. Matthew 23, 23, Even so ye also outward, outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. So we can look like everything's okay, and it isn't. Galatians 8, 3, For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Being contented with how God has made us and what he has given us can give us peace. In the little devotional book, Our Daily Bread, in November of 2021, they had this, and I just love this because it has to do with what people would think, even though it doesn't say it directly. Son, I don't have much to give you, but I do have a good name. Don't mess it up. Those wise, weighty wor words were uttered by Johnny Bettis as his son Jerome left home for college. Jerome quoted his father in his American Professional Football Hall of Fame acceptance speech. He played for the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers and he got up and he gave that. And then at the very end of it, <coughs> he gave similar words to his own son. Son, there's not much that I can give you that's more important than our good name. Proverbs 22.1 A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. Colossians 3.17 Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Caring what people think can keep us from doing or saying the right thing. Thing. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation in public where people were telling things that they shouldn't have been telling and do you just leave do you say something you know what do you do we're we're afraid they're going to think we're awful if we say something Scripture gives us examples of those who were untruthful because they cared what people thought and Elizabeth George has a list, and I chose three from her list. Abraham was untruthful about Sarah, his wife. He told her to say she was his sister because he was afraid they'd kill him so they could have her. So what happened, the king found out that she was his wife and admonished him, why did you say she was your sister? We could have done something awful to her. And then his son Isaac followed in the same pattern about his wife Rebecca being his sister instead of his wife because he wanted the approval of the others. And I've given you the verses there that deal with that. And then Peter, when Jesus said, one of you will deny me, Peter, you know, they were all, is it I, is it I? And Peter said, oh, Lord, I will never deny you. Oh, I love you. I would never do that. And then what happens after Jesus is uh, imprisoned? Peter goes off and he's sitting there around the fire and a little maid comes up and says, Oh, uh, you, you were one of Jesus. Oh, no, I, no, I, I don't know him. And he denied him. And then somebody else came up. And that was the second time. And then the third time, a man came up and said, You were with him. You are dressed like him. And then what did he do? He started cursing so that they would leave him alone. He was afraid of the other people. We often know what is the right thing to do. Now, we may not do it, but we know that it's the right thing to do. James 4, 17, Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Another daily bread in March of 2022, so just <coughs> this month, there was a, a girl who had a best friend at school. Now, can you remember your best friend? We all had best friends, and we all have best friends. But they did everything together. They did projects together in school. 
They pass notes back and forth in school. Now, they weren't in schools I went to because that wouldn't have been allowed or it would have been confiscated and read to the class. Uh, but they just talked about their next sleepover and had such a good time. Well, one morning in church, the pastor talked about salvation. And the young girl was sitting there and she thought, oh, Catherine isn't she doesn't believe as we believe. She doesn't go to church, and I don't think she knows this. I really ought to talk to her. So she got home, and she thought about it that afternoon, and she read Scripture, but she was so afraid it would ruin their friendship that she worried about it for the afternoon, and then she finally called her. She gave her the salvation story, and Catherine started asking questions and was very interested in what she was saying and accepted Christ over the telephone. And it was such a reward to the young lady because she almost didn't do it. She was afraid she was going to leave her friend behind. What compels us to speak up? We care about people like God does. Second Peter 3.9 the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We should think more about caring for people than caring what people think. Romans 14, 10 to 13, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Now notice, we don't give account for anybody else. We give account for ourselves. At let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Now, we have to ask ourselves, what, what's keeping me from speaking out? I really should, but I, I don't know, I'm hesitant. I had most of my training except for grades one through six at Bob Jones and my girlfriend my best girl my best girlfriend Joy and I went up to the University of Bridgeport to the Shakespeare Institute for some of our graduate work we went up there one summer and we knew we were in over our heads as soon as we got there because everybody was middle-aged or older and had taught and all had their PhD so we <laughs> We were in a league that we probably did not belong in. We had had one year of graduate school. But there were two girls about our age, and we just, they were a lot of fun. We loved being with them. Now today, it's sad to say, you hear, oh my, and they take the Lord's name in vain. Commercials, television, everybody does it. But in 1966, it, people did it, but it wasn't that prevalent. And we talked about it, and we prayed about it, and we knew we needed to say something, but they were the only two our age that we could have any fellowship with. But we went to them anyway and told them that we loved the Lord and that it really hurt us when they took the Lord's name in vain. They took it very well. They hadn't even thought of it that way. It's just something that they said and everybody they knew said. But I know that was very difficult to speak up. God is on our side and will help us care about people and do the right thing. Dr. Bob Sr. used to say, you and God make a majority in any situation. And if you have God on your side and you're doing the right thing, it doesn't matter about anybody else. Let people around you at work or in your neighborhood know how much you care for them. Uh, our A. Tory was going to hold an evangelistic tent meeting in a town, and that morning in church, uh, her father, who was the minister, got up and said, we're having a special meeting this afternoon on soul winning. 
So please come out if you're interested in soul winning and telling people about going to uh, this tent meeting. Well, the little girl decided she wanted to go. She was six, but she wanted to go because she wanted to witness to people. And so when she got home at lunch, she was disappointed because her dad said, now I can't be there this afternoon. I've got to hold a funeral service for a particular member of the congregation. And her mother said, well, and I'm going to go with you so that I can, you know, help encourage his wife. So the little girl was disappointed, but they got two sisters, older ladies, to come and take care of the three children. But when the one woman found out how badly she wanted to go, she went with her. Now when she got to the door, the man who was the forerunner, so to speak, of uh, Tori, said, you go home. This meeting isn't for children. And the woman with her said, she's with me and her father is the minister of this church who is having this this afternoon. So they let her go in and he got up and he said, soul willing is all about quoting scripture. You have to quote scripture. You have to quote scripture. She sat there and was encouraged because she, she knew some Bible verses. So when they dismissed, she went out and she got some of the brochures telling about the tent meeting and she went around her neighborhood. She took it very seriously. She went around the neighborhood and she handed the brochure to everybody and quoted a verse of scripture to them. Now they were different people so she could have quoted one verse to everybody but she wasn't thinking that and she finally thought about a new family had moved around the corner so she went and knocked on their door and this great big gruff man came out but he he was kind to her and then she handed him the brochure and the only verse she could think of was and after this the judgment <laughs> and so he said you get out of here and don't you come back I don't want to ever see you again well that really hurt her feelings and made her feel bad she went home but she prayed for that man all week at the end of the week she had two brochures left over so she went to one store and the lady was very kind when she quoted the Bible verse to her and then she went next door which was a music store and she was telling this young man boy those are beautiful instruments and then she gave him the brochure and she quoted John 316 just then that man came out of the back he owned that store and he said and that goes for this store too don't you come back in here again and don't you be doing this well, she cried and cried and cried and her mother tried to console her they went to the meeting that following day that in the evening and the song leader was up directing the music and he stopped in the middle of it and he said there's a little girl with brown hair here who was passing out uh, brochures and quoting scripture. And there's a gentleman up here who would like to see her. Well, she didn't know they were talking about her, so she stood up on the bench and looked because she wanted to see who that little girl was. And as soon as she stood up, that man said, that's the girl. And so they asked her to come forward. That man hugged her, got down on his knees, and he said, I have not been able to get that verse this, after this, the judgment, out of my mind this entire week and she had been praying for him the entire week so he had just gotten saved and he wanted to see who she was caring what God thinks of should be our goal and we should do all to the glory of God gives many examples of people who did it right and I had already filled out my people when I did the questions and Elizabeth George used those same people. So I thought, well, I'm going to go ahead and use them anyway. Esther, in Esther chapter 4 and 5, and you know the story. And someone mentioned it. I don't know if it was Shay or if it was Janet, but somebody has mentioned it in the last few weeks. Esther had to pray for her people. And Mordecai told her he wanted her to go in before the king. And, of course, you know the rules they had you could not go into the king unless you had been summoned but she asked everybody all her maids and everybody else to fast they would fast together and in verse 416 of Esther she says go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me and neither eat nor drink for three days night or day I also and my maidens will fast likewise 
and so will I go unto the king, which is not according to the law. And I've underlined, and if I perish, I perish. She was willing to risk her life for her people and because she knew that's what God wanted her to do. And then Daniel, and we know the story of Daniel's life, but when he and his friends asked nicely not to eat of the king's meat and they were allowed to go that many days or weeks and not eat the king's meat, when the king met with all of them, of course, as you know, they were the fairest of them all. <laughs> they were the healthiest, strongest, and he put them in charge. Then, with another king, when people were jealous of Daniel's position, they had the king sign a decree that no one could pray to anyone but uh, Darius or Darius, and or they would be thrown into the lion's den. And he signed that decree. Now, back in those days, you could not change it, even if you were the king. If you signed a decree, that was the decree. And this always touched me. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God and this is what I want, as he did aforetime, he did not stop anything because of what people might think or do to him. He could have closed the windows and prayed. He could have prayed during the middle of the night and again the next night after it was dark. And he didn't do it. He did it as he had done it aforetime. And then you know the story when he was thrown into the lion's den. The king didn't sleep all night. He fasted and prayed for uh, Daniel and was down there first thing in the morning. Daniel, did your God preserve you? And Daniel said yes. His three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, again, these are familiar stories. I don't need to go into details about them. But they said to the king with that big tall statue, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this manner. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. And then this, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. You know how mad Nebuchadnezzar was, and they made the fiery furnace so hot it, it killed the men who threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into it. And then a little bit later, Nebuchadnezzar said, didn't we throw three men into the fire? Well, there are four men and nobody's bound. And they went and they got them out. And this is the thing that surprises me because you know if you've ever, we don't have to worry too much about smoking areas like we used to. But if you're somewhere where someone's smoking, you just smell like it. They were in the fiery furnace. They did not have any smell on them at all. Not one hair of their head was singed. God had protected them. And then Nebuchadnezzar told everybody not to speak evil at all of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's uh, God. And then Noah in Genesis 6. The, the scripture doesn't tell a lot about Oh, it tells a lot about the ark, and it tells a lot about Noah. It doesn't tell about the people who I'm sure were standing around making fun of him. There had never been any rain before. And they're laughing at him and all of that. Uh, I saw a flannel graph story when I was a child, and it stuck in my mind so much. The people are just laughing and pointing and making fun of him. He went right ahead and did what God told him to. However, the next flannel graph picture was of the rain and the flooding and the men banging on the ark to try to get in. And so Noah did and cared only what God thought. He obeyed God and God protected him and his family. I want to use a modern example. I'm going to hold this up. I don't know if you can see it very well. This is Miss Sarah Oliver. If you went to Bob Jones, you knew Sarah who went to be with the Lord this week at age 98. We went to the funeral. Uh, 
Sunday afternoon and were so blessed by the funeral and by what people in her family said about her that she would tell them what they ought to do. And she didn't worry about all the people around who were listening in. She wanted those children in her neighborhood and in the surrounding neighborhoods to do what was right and in her family. Her family filled up, oh, I'd say two-thirds to three-fourths of the middle section of this church. And there were uh, family members and aunts and uncles and nieces and great-granddaughters and, and all. But Sarah's life was a testimony to doing what God wanted her to do and not worrying about what other people might think as she did it. Elizabeth George says we need to center on God. He is the one asking us to do things, and she was talking herself about speaking, and it is Him I must please. If we please the Lord, we don't need to worry about anybody else. God should be the only person we try to please, and we should ask ourselves, what does God think about this? Rather than what will people think? Our goal is to replace worrying about the approval of others with a genuine desire to gain the approval of God. If we glorify God in all we say and do, people notice and come to know the Lord. 1 Corinthians 10.31, this is something we quoted at Camp Berean up in Indiana. The two years I was a the one of the counselors whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do do all to the glory of God and then I'm going to read what I wrote in here for you that Elizabeth George says are your desires for approval turning you away from God and from following him if you have a relationship with God through his son the Lord Jesus you have the best of all relationships if Jesus is your Savior, He is also your friend, the best of all friends, the ultimate friend. Even if everyone else forsakes you, God is there. Why worry about the approval of others when you have Jesus as your friend who sticks closer than a brother? That's Proverbs 18, 24. God is fully able to enable you to live a victorious Christian life. That's his part. Now it is up to you to do your part, to focus fully on him, not others, and live for him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the lessons we've learned in studying this entire book. We thank you for what we learned for today's lesson, that we need to focus on you and care what you think and not worry about what others think. Uh, we thank you for all the things that you have done for us. And again, we ask your blessing on Linda Watson and on the Gass family today and the other requests that were mentioned. For Jesus' sake, amen.